How many are happy to be in the house of the Lord? I know that uh, Angela mentioned this, but uh, if you haven't registered your child for VBS and you would like to, uh, like, you know, this is the Noah's Ark final warning, I think, because we're actually completely full, but we've added, a, a f like, I think 20 more spots. So uh, even though we've got to figure out how to make that work in this building. Um, so if that's you, uh, make sure, of course, you know, and your child can attend. That's another important caveat um, because, we, you know, one of my favorite things is when you plan something and there's registration and then people don't show up. That's the best. Isn't that great? Um, <clears throat> No, but uh, make sure that you register your child if you haven't. How many had a great uh, Canada Day yesterday? All right. Uh, how many just love our country? Isn't it a great country? We are very blessed. Um, and honestly, I'm just so thankful to the Lord that I'm a Canadian. And, uh, and that I get to live in Canada because I think it's a wonderful uh, country. And this is our promised land. How many know that? It's like, uh, at least for now, if you're a Canadian, you live here, this is your promised land. Amen? Amen. Everybody's got to get warmed up here. But, um, you know, that really is true. And sometimes you've got to uh, fight for your promised land. Yeah. Right? Uh, and uh, I think at times as, a, as believers, we've got to stand up for, for our, our promised land here, Canada. And... Uh, you know, uh, when the children of Israel went into the promised land, you know, it wasn't a picnic, was it? Uh, they had to, uh, to fight and they had to, you know, God began to increase them. And I mean, it was a really, uh, there were some big responsibilities that came with where, where God was leading them. And that's the same with you. Uh, we have a responsibility. And you know, the Lord, one thing I love about the Lord is that He... Uh, you know, how does God reward somebody that, that does well with something? You know, from a biblical point of view, yeah, it's more work. That's right. So, you know, if you feel like you've got a lot of work to do in this nation, it's like, well, hey, maybe that's you, okay? Um, so we just want to say Happy Canada Day to everybody. Remind everyone, please stay after the service. I think we have a lot of food. So I hope you're hungry. How many are hungry? Oh, boy. Okay. I got my work cut out for me today, I can tell. Uh, okay. Well, how, this will be easy. Uh, how many loved last week with Leif? Oh, man. Wasn't that great? And if, uh, if you weren't able to be here, I want to encourage you to get the USB for it because it was just transformational. I, th I just felt God did so much and and I saw that at work in people's lives throughout the week. It was just an amazing, amazing time together. And, uh, and I, I really hope he comes back. Uh, wouldn't that be great? I think we'll have him try to get him next year. Um, I was kind of curious. Did anybody have any chair two opportunities this week? <laughs> I felt like Monday morning was a chair two for me. You know, it was like, oh. Okay, so I need to work on this still. For those of you who weren't here, he kind of had this three-chair message where, you know, you, you know, living from this place of promise instead of seeing all the problems, you know, that would be like seated in chair one kind of deal. And he uses this kind of metaphor to explain our walk with the Lord, right? And, and uh, anyway, it was just such a great time, and uh, I feel like we still need that, right? Like, okay, Lord, we just want to live from this place of promise, and see things the way you want us to see them in our lives. And so, uh, anyway, it was a real blessing to have Leif here. Uh, so what I want to talk today about, actually, let's go to Isaiah chapter 1. And we're going to take a look at uh, verse 19. And a couple weeks ago, I we did a sermon on, I think it was titled, God can get the best out of you. And this is going to be part two of that today, but really, I think it's more like I want to title it, you know, how do we get new vision? That's probably a better title. So that'll be the title for today. But let's read out of Isaiah chapter one, verse 19. 
And it says this, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Um, you know, another way that verse is, is written in another translation, it says, if you let me help you, you will eat the good of the land. How many could use some help from the Lord? Um, but I think the point is, God wants to lead us into good things, into the good of the land. Um, God wants to get the best out of you. He wants you to have a meaningful life, uh, full of promises fulfilled, full of joy, full of hope, full of peace, full of love, full of life. Amen? Okay. All right. That's true, isn't it? Um, okay, I'll just keep going here, I guess. You know, we like that Proverb, uh, Proverb 30, or 20, uh, 13, verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled or promises fulfilled is a tree of life. You know, I think most of us would know the first part of that verse, or at least know it better than the second part of the verse, which is promises fulfilled is the tree of life. It's a tree of life in your life. I mean, that's a... a, a uh, a tree that produces fruit year after year, seeing God's promises come to pass. And, you know, there is a way to live your life that's going to be more fruitful. Um, you know, yeah, exactly. More fill, filled with more peace, uh, more hope. I would add, you're going to be more effective with less. You know, how many have heard that less is more? <laughs> Right? Man, it's, everything's just dying right now. Okay, we'll keep going. So, it's God's instruction for right living, if you're willing and obedient, that's going to lead you forward into the good of the land. You know, God never leads you backwards, does He? He wants to lead you forward. And uh, God never uses you. He's not a user. He only blesses, right? You know, it's the devil who uses people. And he's been doing that since the beginning, right? In the garden, he was using people, manipulating people, framing problems, framing circumstances in their life. He's a really, he's a really good framer. Um, you know, one I think of is from the book of Revelation, where we see in Revelation chapter 17, the, the woman, the harlot, riding the beast. How many know what I'm talking about, that verse, or that uh, chapter? Anyway, it's this parenthetical chapter in the book of Revelation that, that details how um, this religious system, not just at the end of the age, but throughout all of human history, uh, was being used by, by the enemy, by the devil, and that there was coming a moment that he was going to turn, the beast was going to turn on the, the harlot and was going to eat her flesh. So it's kind of an intense uh, verse, but it's, it's really detailing how even throughout history, a system that the devil has propped up, which is a false religious system throughout every single empire, and you know, you see these similarities you know, in different empires. And it's like, well, how did that all happen? It's like, well, you know, the devil's active in both areas. But anyway, okay, that's another topic. Um, and, you know, eventually he's going to say, okay, no longer are we going to have this religious system, but I, I want to, he wants to make himself like the most high, right? Do we know, you know, that's, that's one of the, the, the things that he desires the most. I will be like the most high. That's the, the devil. Anyway, um, and so the point being is that he has used so many. And uh, he is a user. And we see that today in, in our culture. We see that today with influential people. Um, you know, you just think of, uh, you know, these leaders and tech leaders and and different things. You know how much the devil wants to rule them? Um, and, and he's actively working at that, right? 
I remember Neville Johnson years ago had this prophetic word about all these tech leaders and how the devil was going to start really going after them because he was going to start seeing their significance and their influence. And I'm like, it's so obvious today that that has been taking place. And you start to see all these little things come out about their personal lives. And it's like, you know, I don't want to get into this all, but like, you know, the whole Epstein thing. And it's like how influential he was in all these tech leaders' lives and different leaders. And you're like, my goodness, all of this evil is going on under the surface. And it's like, well, what is the devil doing? He's trying to use people to get what he wants. But the, but the God that we serve never uses anyone. He only blesses. And uh, anyway, I'm getting some text here, but, um, you know, I wanted to, to mention, you know, it's that James 1, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father, right? So he's the one who blesses. Um, and for you and I, getting back to that Isaiah chapter 1, if you are willing and if you are obedient, right, that's the key. You will eat the good of the land. And, and so for you and I, I want you to know there's no substitute for obeying the Lord. Okay? There's no substitute. In other words, if you do everything else perfectly, but you miss that, you're missing the big picture too, right? And so there's no substitute for obedience and walking in the will of God for your life. And so what we need to do is we need to take time to get instructed by Him for our life. And you know, I think if you don't take time, I'm not prophesying this, but like, you know, your life could be difficult. Right? You know, what is that verse in Proverbs? It's like, the, uh, the way of the transgressor is hard. You know, how many, how many have like seen someone that you haven't seen for a while and you're like, okay, they went through the ringer. And you're like, man, you know, their face looks like a catcher's mitt or something, you know what I mean? But <laughs> that sounded bad. Um, <laughs> let's roll it back. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's just like they've went through... Just the, the, the wages of sin. It's just taking a toll on their life. <laughs> I'm not looking at anybody here, okay? <laughs> just relax. Oh boy, I'm in trouble now. All right, let's move on. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 17. Man, I, I was not expecting a negative reaction, but... Okay. <laughs> All right, First Kings 17. All right, can I pull this back, you think? I'll be okay? All right, good. You guys are fine. Um, last, last time we spoke about this, we did uh, First Kings 17 where it talks about Elijah and when there was a famine in the land. Oh, boy, okay. There was a famine in the land. God had a specific place for him to live, right? And so that's uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 2. We can read it here. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook that I've command, and, and I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, and he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook, and it happened after a while that the brook dried up, because uh, there had been no rain in the land. And so, um, I think last time we talked about this, we, we basically went over how when we listen to the Lord and we have, um, and we have that obedience component, there's going to bring, uh, there's going to be a provision component to it, 
Okay? So obeying the Lord is going to bring provision. Okay? So that's a great mark for you and I to shoot for, by the way. It's like, um, you know, let's listen to the Lord and trust that he's going to bring the provision for what, what, what he's leading us into. Right? So that's part one. But what happens when something changes? And this is what I want to talk about today, where it's like when you go through something and uh, stuff dries up in your life, because this is what ends up happening uh, to Elijah, is he ends up uh, you know, going into uh, this brook and everything's good, the ravens are coming, the water's there, and he's just in this place of security, this place of peace, but then all of a sudden something shifts, and now the, the river or the brook is drying up, and the ravens stop coming, and so he needs to now get new vision for what God wants to do next. Now, is there anybody here who you're feeling that? This is a time for me to get new vision. Okay, quite a few of you. Yeah, good. Good, well, this is a message for you then, okay? So, uh, this is, uh, this is kind of what we want to talk about. Now, first of all, in this story, two, two good thoughts. When, number one is when we listen to the Lord, you're going to have provision, okay? You're going to come out ahead. But then number two is when things dry up in our lives, that's a sign God wants to give you something new. He wants to lead you into something else. And, and so, of course, what we know is Elijah goes to the widow, and there's this divine appointment, and there's a need that this widow has that Elijah is sent to kind of help with, right? And, uh, and so, okay, that's, that, that's like God bringing him into purpose, bringing him into what he has for him. But our question needs to be this, is how do we get new vision, okay? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Number one is this. The first thing we need to do is to make the decision that we're going to follow him. All right? Now, if you remember in the book of Ruth, and I talk about this story a lot, but Ruth, if you remember, she gets hit with tragedy, and she has this moment where she's like, okay, um, you know, I'm not really sp- knowing what I'm supposed to do next. Her husband dies, her, her father-in-law dies, and, and so she's kind of taking care of Naomi, and it's like, well, Naomi tells her, hey, we have this place back in Israel. Let's move back there. And, and the other lady, uh, she doesn't, and... And so she has to make a choice in her own life what to do. But what she does is she says something. This is in Ruth 1.16 where she says uh, to Naomi, your people are going to be my people. Your God is going to be my God. And it's almost like she puts the stake down in her life that no matter what happens, I'm going to follow the Lord. All right? So from that point on, it's almost like she steps onto the path. You know, if she would have stayed there, she probably would have got a nice life. Everything would have been fine, I'm sure. Good things probably would have happened. But it was in that decision where she stepped on the path that now led her towards destiny. Okay? And that's what you and I want, right? We want to have a meaningful life that's close to the Lord, right? We want to walk as close to Him as we can. And so she begins to now just kind of do what she can. You know, nothing happens overnight, but she's on the path. She's saying yes to the Lord, and it's God who begins to orchestrate her steps so that she lands exactly where she's supposed to be. And, you know, she ends up being at Boaz's place as she gets into the lineage of David and the lineage of Jesus. You know the story. And uh, it's this transformational thing but it's, it's, it's really this. When we make a decision um, to say yes to the Lord and we learn to cooperate with His plan for our lives, it's almost like He begins to open these doors now. Okay? You start meeting people at the right place, at the right time. Things start to happen outside of your control And it's almost like this providential guidance begins to fall into place where things uh, start to work together for your good. Okay? So number one, though, is you have to make that decision. 
And by the way, that's a continual decision. It's not a one-time deal. That's something you do every morning, all right? Now, the second thing is this. How are you guys doing? Everybody's okay? Did we get past my, my joke? <laughs> okay, good. I'm like, oh boy, what did I... Sometimes, you, you know, when you're up here, you, you, trust me, you say a lot of things you didn't think you were going to say. I'm just telling you. Do it long enough, and uh, it just kind of happens. Um, number two, so that's number one. Number two is you need to get into the Word of God. Amen? Every day, daily bread. Okay? So I want to encourage you. Set some time apart to get into the Word of God. And I'm going to believe that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you out of His Word. You know, we, we love the Word of God and, and, uh, and we want to put a high value of it on our lives and, or in our lives. Um, and, you know, for, for, for me, it's so important, I think, to understand, you know, the context of the way things are written, you know, just kind of the her- hermeneutics of it all and, and just how valuable that is to understanding what God is saying and all that um, but then there's also times where we can just get hit with like what we would call a rhema word, which is just that inspired word for that moment for your life. Okay? And so you won't do that if you're not reading it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's this verse that uh, is out of Isaiah. It's Isaiah 42, verse 12. Um, maybe you guys can just throw that up there. But it's, uh, oh boy, i got to find it here. If you, yeah, 42.12. Look at this. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare His praise in the coastlands. Another version says, in the islands. Um, and so, you know, it's a great verse. You know, um, you could go into the historical context of what they're trying to say, what Isaiah's uh, sharing about that. But... Um, what I think is really interesting is this kind of famous story from T.L. Osborne. And he was one day reading Isaiah. And he was reading Isaiah 42. And he comes across that verse, verse 12, declare his praise in the islands. And as he's reading that verse, something about it, how many have ever had this, just hit him. And it was like a word from the Lord, an inspired word from the Lord for that moment the Holy Spirit spoke to him out of the Word of God. And what he felt in his heart was it was God telling him to go to Jamaica and begin to preach the gospel in Jamaica. And so what he did was he just went. He went, and I think it was in the first couple weeks there, they saw hundreds of people saved. They saw, I think, over 100. Actually, I wrote it down. Um, They saw 135 Uh, deaf and mute people that were healed. They saw 90 blind people receive their sight and they saw hundreds of crippled people walk away on their own two legs. And it was all a a response to just being in the Word. Okay, so get into the Word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you out of His Word. All right? Now the third thing that we want to talk about, we're talking about, okay, how do we... How do we prepare for something new? How, do we, how are we ready for that? And, you know, um, this is a really important one, is who you choose to walk with is really, it really matters. I'll take a sip on that part. So who you go with matters. And I'll give you two biblical examples of this. Um, The first one is with Lot. Now, if you remember Lot, he was with Abraham, and he kind of tagged along with Abraham. Um, Once he got too big for his britches, he decided, okay, you know what? We're going to go our own way. We're going to take the good piece of land, and you go take this garbage piece over here. And, you know, the next time we catch up with him, you remember he's living in Sodom and Gomorrah, now, and it's like, you know, his family's kind of a mess. He's, he's like 
doing all these stupid decisions. And it was a pretty big drop off after he stopped hanging out with Abraham. So, you know, another example is Paul when he gets shipwrecked. It's like Paul, uh, you know, he gets on this boat going to Rome and this huge storm happens. No one on that boat dies. But I just got the, you know, you got to wonder, did somebody else die during that storm on a different boat? Do you know what I mean? It was like everyone on Paul's boat was very fortunate that they happened to be on Paul's because that was the one that was getting the angelic visitations, right? So, you know, good things. Um, so the point is, until you get it figured out, walk with people who've kind of got it figured out, or at least they're going the right direction. Amen? And, you know, I want to encourage you, key people are going to come alongside you that you need. I just want to just kind of declare that over you today. And life friends, you know, those types of things. God knows what you have need of. And uh, he knows what you need to get you where you need to go. Okay? You know, and by the way, the Bible is very... If you look at God's interactions with people, he's very... Um, like sympathetic to their needs. Like so people that are dealing with loneliness, he really um, understands that and is actually really sympathetic to it and wants to bring people. So you remember when uh, Elijah was like, God, you know, we got nobody. I have nobody. Um, and he's kind of telling the Lord. And he's like, no, actually, we got a few people. I still got a few. A <laughs> um, few thousand. Uh, but what does he do right after that? He connects him with Elisha right away. That's like the next thing he's supposed to do. Start mentoring Elisha. And he, you know, I love this story of um, Paul. So I don't want to go over the whole thing, but you guys remember the story where Paul and Barnabas have their falling out? So it's Acts uh, 15. And they have this contention over John Mark, who uh, went on a very difficult mission trip we'll call it, and, uh, and uh, he kind of is like not doing good on the trip. And so Paul is kind of not happy with him, and he tells Barnabas, we're not bringing this guy with us on any more mission trips, okay? And Barnabas, you know, they call him, you know, the, what is it, son of encouragement? It's, you know, he's a big encourager, so... Every encourager you know, they don't want people left out, right? And I think that's just a, that's the nature of God, too. He doesn't want anybody left out. Um, so that's a good thing. But he's, they have this huge fight over this where Paul and Barnabas, like the most amazing, best of the best apostles, they cannot come to an agreement on this. And so they go their separate ways. Paul and Silas go their own way. And, uh, and then uh, Mark and, and Barnabas go their own. But you know what I love about that story is later on in life, Paul comes around. And he, in one of his letters, he says, Ah, oh, okay, you can bring him. You know, let's get him in there, I guess. You know? So he did come around. But, you know, it just goes to show us that when things don't, and this is a side trail, but when things don't go well, it's almost like God, God has made, he's made provision for it. You know, Mark goes on to write the gospel of Mark, which every single generation since then has been blessed by. So God had a different assignment for him. But not only that, in chapter 16 of Acts, the very next chapter, uh, Paul meets Timothy, who is a lifelong friend and, 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 and spiritual son to him. So anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent. We're talking about how relationships can be connected to your destiny. And, you know, there are times when you're going to have to fight for people in your life. Okay? Value people. Um, Paul comes around later on that. Then there's some times when, you know, 
God almost will like shift a season with friendships where, yeah, you love them, but it's like, okay, maybe there's something you, different right now. Is it okay that I talk about this? <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to get your permission here. Um, you know, sometimes these things where they're very one-sided or whatever, you know, and Leif talked a lot about that too, right? It's, it's like, Jesus had the 12, he had the three, he had the one. There was like, God wants to develop healthy relationships, okay? And you guys are so quiet right now. Um, and, and I think part of that is people seeing you and seeing your heart, um, seeing your potential, uh, I think you want to call out the gold in each other, right? You know, you get around someone who loves you and they're filled with faith. It's like, you know, they just call the gold out of you. Just spending, just proximity, osmosis. It's like, I love the story with David and his mighty men. Leif talked about this too. It's like, the Bible started, they started out just in shambles, these guys. And just by being around someone who loved them and valued them, believed in them, when everyone else rejected them, uh, completely transformed their lives so that now they're killing these giants too. And, and you know, I, whenever we talk about that, we just say, man, that's what we want here is we want a culture where we're just believing in each other and, it, and we start to grow together. All right. Okay. But, you know, there's this other component of it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. If you can put that up. First Corinthians 15, verse 33, says this, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Uh, so you want to have good habits in your life. And you want people that are going the same direction as you. And so get around people that have good habits. Amen? Amen. Um, people that have a hunger for the Lord that value his kingdom. Uh, I think that's so important. And get around people with good habits. But I'll tell you this, if you're around people and they're just constantly negative towards, you know, your walk with the Lord or just your, you know, just any of that, it's not like you got to cut people out or anything. I'm not saying cut somebody out of your life, but just, you know, Jesus even, or in the, in the Bible it even says like, don't cast your cur or pearls before swine. Right? So I'm quoting the Bible there. So if that was an insult, that's from the Bible. So take it up, take it up with the author. Um, but you know what I'm saying? It's like nurture healthy relationships, people that are going the same direction. And you know what I find is you go through a few wars in life or a few battles in life. You start to see... Do you know what I'm talking about? The people that are connected for life and destiny. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes God has a way of showing us that. Um, but don't cut people out. I'm not, that's not my message today. Uh, I will make a joke, though. Uh, you know, we always kind of say this joke on this, but like some people are like clouds. You know, when they disappear, it's a beautiful day. But don't... Don't cut people, because every person's valuable. Every person is significant. I think what I want to highlight is get around people that are filled with faith, that are going to encourage you in the Lord, okay? Um, all right. Number four is this. Get into an atmosphere where you can hear from God. Now, I love this verse in uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Uh, and this is where Paul and Barnabas are being separated for the work of the ministry. It says this in verse 1. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, uh, Lucius, uh, Menean, uh, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord, fasted, uh, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate 
to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And so this was like, you know, not a commissioning, but this was an assignment being given from heaven. And it was being given from an atmosphere of worship, of prayer, of fasting, right? And so I want you to see this. That is where God directs them from, okay? Now, obviously, he can sovereignly do whatever he wants. If you're watching Netflix, he could break into the room, and yeah, here is a message for what you're supposed to do. Uh, but he didn't do that. He actually directed them from an atmosphere of worship and from prayer and from fasting. And so the message is this. You and I, we need to cultivate a lifestyle of that, of worship, of prayer, and of fasting. Okay? And it's from that place where God wants to speak to you. Okay? And by the way, if you don't know how to do that, we have weekly prayer going every, every uh, week, Monday to Friday. You can come out and get in that atmosphere, okay? Um, and so we want to be deliberate uh, with our time, okay? So we're talking about getting new vision. And the four points that we've mentioned is we've got to put the stake down, number one, that you're going to follow God no matter what. Number two, we're going to get into the Word every day. We're going to let Him speak to you out of the Word, uh, number three is uh, who you walk with in life is going to matter. Number four is we get into an atmosphere uh, of his presence. Now, just before we, we close, the next thing I want to mention is the timing component of it all. We need to understand that there is a timing component in the kingdom of God. Amen? Okay. You know, we looked at uh, James 1 a few uh, months ago. We did a, just kind of a lot on James 1, actually, but I just want to quickly reference that. James 1, verse 1, it says, James, a bondservant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, uh, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may uh, be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And so, we kind of went over those four verses. How many remember that? We spent a lot of time on it. And really the idea is this, that word sc scattered abroad, it has this idea that it's like, you know, they're just wherever. But it's actually more uh, explaining like God is planting them as a seed. So it's like what seems really sporadic to you is actually very by design from God. And so the idea was God was hand placing people. So this is what James is sharing to this group. Hey, you're hand placed by God. And I know you've went through a difficult time because they just had come out of deep uh, time of persecution, right? Um, they, got, they, had, they got pushed out of Israel because they were Christians. And so now they're in all these different parts of the, the world. And James is trying to say to them, hey, listen, that was by design. And so don't, you know, don't uh, try to get out of it prematurely. Count it all joy when you go through that. You know why? Because God's producing something in your life. And what is that? It's patience. Okay. And that's something you're going to need, right? So anyway, that was like our message. Um, oh, no, I'm still going. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I got like a whole nother sermon going here, guys. That was my message from like three months ago. Don't, don't, be, don't be getting me out of here too quick, all right? Um, <laughs> thank you, though. Yeah, I... I Bless you guys. Okay, so the timing component of it all. That's where I was going. <laughs> Let's go to Luke 2. And I think I'll maybe do one or two verses, then we're going to close. But, um, and I'll make it really clear when I'm closing. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy. 
All right, two, let's look at verse one. I think I'm in the right church for this verse. Luke 2, verse 1. And now it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place, I don't know how to say his name, while Quirinus was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Now, how many have ever had a governing body make a decision for you that you didn't like? (laughs) Well, you know, join the club. Uh, Caesar Augustus, this very famous Roman emperor, makes a decision, you know, 5,000 kilometers away in Rome, we need a census. So therefore, we're going to put out every single person in our, you know, governing area, and there's nothing they can do about it. And so now we see uh, Mary and Joseph Mary has this uh, baby. She's ready to to give birth. She's nine months pregnant. And they have to make the trip for the census. Right? And we know they show up. There's no room at the end. It's all just this divine setup, though. And what a huge pain in the butt that must have been. Um, and Jesus was born. I just love the way the Lord works because on this part, he used the governing. Okay, take it easy, you two. (laughs) Or is that them up here? Okay. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, You have the governing body, uh, Caesar, saying, okay, this is what we're doing. So that's on the front side of the birth. And it's incredibly inconvenient. They don't, there's, there's not like a ton of direction that we see on why. They just are stuck in the cog of the system. Isn't that crazy? And it's exactly orchestrated by heaven. And here they are being moved into promise fulfilled. Remember, he needed to be born in Bethlehem. Jesus needed to be born in Bethlehem. And then I love on the other side of it, he gets a dream about, you know, okay, now we got to go to Egypt. So the direction in one sense was completely outside of their control. And then the the following direction was guidance, direct guidance from heaven. Do you see how God just didn't mind using either? And by the way, he didn't mind, he didn't have to tell them the whole story either. So... Um, I think I just want you to see God is operating on, a, on an entirely different level than you are. Okay? You know, and a lot of times he'll, lead, he'll allow circumstances or he'll arrange circumstances for two reasons. Number one is to protect us. Um, you know, you think of Jonah, you think of uh, Hosea's wife. Saul, who later becomes Paul, it's like, uh, and then just what we mentioned, Joseph having that, that word to go to Egypt at the right time. So, so you know, in many ways, um, God will arrange our circumstances to protect us. And the other way is just, just to kind of lead us, right? Uh, protect us and then direct us, which rhymed. So there you go. Um, and, and we see that all throughout the Bible. And just the importance of obeying the voice and, and, and heeding what God's doing. But there is this timing component. That sense has happened at the right time. Uh, there's another one that is a really good example is with Moses. You know, Moses, uh, we talk a lot about his story and, you know, the early years and, and even just 
the destiny on his life. You remember, the destiny on his life was from, from birth. And, and that's the same with you, by the way. But, uh, but Moses, at age 40, has this feeling, and he has this kind of nudge on his heart that he was called to be the deliverer for his people. One day he comes out and he sees this uh, Egyptian man, you know, beating a, a Hebrew, and he just loses it. He kills the guy, hides the body, and you know the story. He eventually runs away, and he's in the wilderness for 40 years. And just probably lamenting all of that. But, you know, a lot of times when we talk about that story, we talk about those seeds of destiny. Okay? You guys still with me? Okay. So the seeds of destiny message, it talks, Neville used to have this uh, uh, quote that he would always say, take note of what makes you come alive because it's a part of your destiny, likely. And so sometimes it's like people just, I don't know why, I just have this, love for this certain people group and I just was always wanting to go and you know it's just sometimes we don't know why God puts those desires and those those longings in our hearts sometimes um and so anyway Neville has this really great message and he kind of details how uh how Moses at the age of 40 didn't have the character but had the, just kind of all those characteristics inside him, and he knew that God had uniquely designed him to lead the people out of Egypt, even though you know, he didn't have the language or the skill or the ability or even the know-how of how to do this the right way. All right, so that's kind of uh, the message, and you know, there's a lot of other examples of that. Uh, throughout the Bible. But, you know, this is kind of an interesting story. Let's go to Genesis chapter 15. And I want you to see this from a different point of view. So, in Genesis chapter 15, this is where God is speaking to Abraham. And it's so early, his name's still Abram, right? And let's go to verse 13. It says this, Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. Okay? And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried at a good old age but in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Um, so a couple thoughts on that. Number one, I love the word of the Lord to him that he was going to die in peace at a nice old age. How many like that one? Yeah. Um, that's great. And, you know, uh, you can take that word too, you know, Psalms 92, they shall be fresh and flourishing, you know, even as they as they as we age but I need you to see something really important here and it's verse 16 he God speaks to him and says in the fourth generation they shall not return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete so when you and I are looking at a situation and we're looking at a circumstances we're looking at it just very narrowly and for this what would we say? We would say, okay, well, obviously, God doesn't want people to suffer. He doesn't want anyone to be subjected to slavery. Like, this is an evil thing that's happening. But on the other side of that, God is kind of, you know, like looking at this in a, in a much different way, a much bigger way. And he's seeing a few different things that, that Moses wasn't seeing, right? And so when Moses made a decision... I'm going to go out and we're going to fight this thing and we're going to destroy it all and I'm going to lead these people out. He was doing that 40 years before God asked him to do it. Right? Are you guys with me? So in other words, things work when it's the right time. They just do. Moses tried to open that door at year 360 instead of year 400. And God was saying, okay, there's a lot more going on here that, 
that I need you to realize, and you don't realize it, okay? So, <clears throat> what does that bring us to? I think it just highlights something really important. You and I, we need to see things the way God sees them. We really do. And I think just even in our culture, even in our country, and just, you know, there can be just room for all these frustrations, but we really need to start asking the Lord for His perspective on things. You know, I remember that story with Elisha where he's, you know, uh, you know with his servant, and he's freaking out. And he says, you know, God, just open his eyes. Let him just see from, from your perspective. And it's like he opens his eyes, and you see all these chariots all around, and it's like, oh, Lord. Like, you really are, you really are seated on the throne. Um, okay, so we want to think like him. We want to see things the way that he see things, sees things. You know, it says in Romans 12, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You know, you're going to, as you get closer to the Lord, as you get into the Word, you're going to start seeing things and looking at situations the way God has called you to, to look at them. Amen? All right, so we're talking about the timing component. The last thing I want to say about it is this, and it's out of Luke chapter 9. Are you guys with me still? This is a long sermon, but you know what? They gave me too much time, so I was like, oh, it's like I could take all day. Luke 9, verse 51. This is kind of an interesting thing. It says, Now it came to pass when uh, the time had come for him, speaking of Jesus, to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So it's almost telling us here that there's like a shift in Jesus' ministry at this moment. Because not before that, you know, he was doing ministry and he was preaching, he was healing the sick and doing all these different things. But now is the time for him to go to the cross, right? So that's kind of like, okay, there's a season shift in Jesus' life. Do you notice how it didn't take him, you know, three years to shift over? Yeah. It was instantaneous, and I just feel the Holy Spirit on that for some reason. But, um, and it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And they went, they entered into the uh, village of, of the Samaritans to prepare for him, but they did not receive him. And this is the whole Sons of Thunder verse coming up. But um, what I think is interesting about this is it's like sometimes what will happen is when God wants to give us new vision or something different, we can have this tendency to revert to the old, go to what we've known, what's been comfortable. And I think as a church, we have to be really careful of that because it's like, well, this was really great last year. and You know, this went well. And it's like, okay, well, that doesn't mean God's still on it. You know, so we got to be sensitive to that. Um, that might have just been for last year, you know what I mean? But for Jesus, what you start to see is people don't respond. People aren't responding the same way. They didn't receive him there. And it was like, what? Now they're not receiving? It's like, so the point is, is when God changes the season in our lives, sometimes the things that worked in the past, they might have been good, they might have been healthy, they might have been fine, but they might not be for now, right? And so that's what happened with Jesus. And so for you and I, sometimes if you run into a bit of a wall, um, things that used to work that don't work, that can be a sign. Okay, God actually wants, wants you to seek him about this, all right? And, you know, favor, and part of that is really connected to, to all of this timing thing. You know, you hit a wall during the wrong season, all of a sudden, the doors open up when it's the right time. Just like with Moses, it was like, you know, he's doing it in his own strength. He's thinking this is the right thing, and everything falls apart. But when God 
God's on it, and the timing's right, it's like everything is different. Everything's different. And so we got to trust Him. We got to trust Him. And I believe for some today, He wants to give you new vision for your life. Maybe you're like um, Elijah, where the brook is dried up. And it's like, okay, Lord, what are you doing in my life? What do you want to do in my life? Well, I want to encourage you. That's a time to do with those four things. Let's, let's seek him. Let's put the stake down in our lives. Then we're going to serve him no matter what. Let's, I forgot the number two. What was number two? <laughs> yeah, get in the word. Come on. I should have known that. Thank you. This is my niece, by the way. Isn't she awesome? Just wave. You can say hi. Just, yeah. um, what was number three? <laughs> yeah, who choose? God's putting kingdom people in your life. Um, you know, let's just let's let's ask Him for that, Lord. Just kingdom people. Um, and then number four. Yeah, get into that atmosphere. So, amen. Let's pray. Brenda, why don't you come? Um, thank you. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you. Let's just fix our eyes on him. Ah, Lord, we just thank you. We honor your presence. We ask that you would come and just inhabit this place. God, we, we honor what you're doing, Lord. Lord, for those who need new vision today, Father, I ask that you would just meet them and give them new vision. Lord, People that need to just be revived. Maybe they've had these vision, this vision from you, but they've just put it on the shelf for so long that it's almost just completely died away. Lord, I ask that you would renew those visions, that vision today. And Lord, I thank you. You want to do great and mighty things through every single person here. Lord, we want to see things the way you see them. God, we want to understand what you're doing in our lives, in our in our world, we want to be as close to you as we can. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And everybody said, thank you, Holy Spirit.